working for me. Hi, everyone. Hi. Does that work, Shilpa? No. Can we have try this again? Hi. Not working. Oh, but no, no. This is very yeah. thakela types. <laughs> Not working. Not working, yeah. I want be one with that Josh, yeah, living enthusiastic. I know Bangalore is little dull and gloomy since two days. But I should not stop us from doing our things, you know. So with a Josh. Ah, bolo, bolo, jaldi, jaldi. Let's do this on one, two, three. three. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi. All four as well, say. Hi, Yeah, this is ready. One, two, three, start. Hi, ah. This is better. Have you noticed none of the boys are telling us hi? That's what, I don't know why. Only the girls I see. Boys, what happened? Bus. Bus? Shilpa, she is Bijal as you know. Now, before we begin, I would just like to highlight, you might be thinking, what is it, why are we called here today? What is it going to happen? What exactly we are supposed to do here, right? It's very simple. We will be talk, interacting with Bijal ma'am about her story, about her, you know, how she became, a, or became an author. Second thing, about her journey, how she could do that. And the most important, why? That is because so many of us have some passions in their life. So we urge, we want to uh, tell this young generation to please read and read more. I believe here more, many of you like to read, right? Yes or no? Yes. Yeah, how many is that? Can just raise hands? Only well, this much? Okay, okay, not bad, not bad. Yes, so we want our younger generation to read more and more and maybe one fine day you can just spend all your thoughts and you know, may, you know, create your passion or you know, write something. Maybe you can get accomplished in few years of time down the line and how and how you can do that, that is what we are going to interact with Bijal ma'am. Is that clear? Yeah, shall we begin? Yes. Bijal, again, welcome you. <laughs> okay, so I, uh, first question, I believe that a person's learning has got a lot to do with person's interest as well, right? So how did it all start? Because uh, were you already interested? Do you know you were interested in writing? And how did it actually begin? Because you are a poet, yeah. Uh, firstly, thank you for calling me young. I think we're surrounded by many young people, so I don't qualify here. <laughs> but uh, how did I start? Uh, you know, I was uh, around 10 years, uh, I was in the fifth standard, and my father had worked with a bank, and the bank transferred him from Delhi to what was their Bombay. And I used to love Delhi. Um, you know, we used to go for picnics in Lodi Garden, we would go climb trees over there, there were squirrels outside my house in Deathcall. And then suddenly we moved to Bombay, where outside my window there was another house, laundry, and one good laundry. And I was just like, excuse me, why is everything great? And um, I was a very shy child, I was very introverted. And the only thing I had for company was that good mohan tree and books and I used to write this dear diary because Betty of Archie's used to write a diary so I said I'll also write a diary <laughs> and so my diary was just full of complaints about Bombay which is a city I absolutely love now but at that point it was just like my sister hit me she's so mean I don't like her or it was just like oh Del uh, Delhi was so much nicer this, uh, this place I can't find any squirrels and I think that process of putting my thoughts down helped this introverted child become much more emotionally stable in many ways. Dealing with a new school where everyone was, Karina Kapoor was my junior for instance. So you know that was the kind of school I was going to. And that's how I actually started putting my thoughts down. And that I think was the beginning of the journey towards becoming an author. Interesting. That's good. 
I mean, it's really interesting how you started, you know. So, at a very quite young age, you had decided, I mean, you want to be. No, I wanted to be, I wanted to rescue penguins. Oh, is it? Yeah. Oh. Only there were no penguins in India. Okay. And so then instead, um, I grew up and uh -huh. I did a mass media course like you all. And then at that point, mass media was a 12 year thing. It was one subject in class, you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I started working with um, people in animal advocacy, working on wildlife. And I used to, we used to do a lot of rescue. So I never rescued a penguin, but I rescued tigers and elephants oh. and lions from circuses. And then I started writing about them. And then this magazine, which was very iconic at that time in Mumbai called Time Out, asked me if I'd like to join them as a reporter. And suddenly I got this different lens to looking at the city that I've lived in. I would go out and do stories about uh, why are there two types of monkey species in Sanjay Gandhi National Park? <laughs> or where did Dada Bhai Navroji live in Bombay? And where was his house? Because all the roads in Atheri are called DN. DN yeah. yeah. Road. Exactly. So suddenly my interest started really, uh, uh, you know, about the city started becoming very much there. And if you look at my books, they're pretty much about places also. Yes. Like Kura is based in Mumbai. Savi is in a fictional city that could be Bangalore really. And so that's when I became, uh, started writing. And then in 2015, uh, somebody asked me, would you write a book about all the work you've done? And so uh -huh. I wrote my first non-fiction book that way. Oh, it all started that way. All your experiences together. That's very interesting. <laughs> So how do you feel now to be being recognized for the second time in the same flag? This, this is like year after year you are being recognized for your work. Honestly, uh, I don't... I mean, I'm very grateful to author and JK paper for the kind of recognition they've given to women authors. I mean, there was a time when women authors couldn't put their name on books. We had to go with a book with a male byline so that books would be bought. Is it? Yeah. And, uh, or, and then even like when I was reporting about books, uh, and I would notice that books for children mm -hmm. predominantly had male, uh, had boys on the cover. Like even J.K. Rowling went as J.K. Rowling. No one knew her name was Joanne. Uh, and so I asked somebody and she said, oh, the, the thing is that there's a study that shows that if you put girls on covers of children's books, boys will not read it. But if boys are on the cover, girls will anyway read it. And that's the kind of biases that we've seen in literature, which is really changing because today women make up most of the writing force. They're changing literature. The way it's being written, the way it's being edited. Most of the editors that I worked with some of the finest editors are women, and they are directors. Both uh, this book of mine was art directed by a fantastic woman designer, and I think that sort of recognition to say that women, when uh, to champion women achievers, I think to me that's what really, really makes a difference. Well, that's really amazing. Well said. So your books are also, when you talk about your books, your books are also very different. But the, particularly, it's from the same aspect of environment. Yeah, I have a one-track mind. No, but then, but, but how could you manage all that? Because your first book talks about air pollution, the, I mean, that uh, Bura, okay? And then the second, Savi, the memory, uh, Savi, that talks about, again, uh, about some environmental aspects. So how could you manage? And how do you think of different uh, aspects all the time? So to give you a little backdrop, uh, a cloud called Buddha is anyone from Mumbai here? Anyone from Delhi? Oh, lots of Delhi people. Okay, so uh, I was studying environment, security, and peace, and I came across something called the brown cloud phenomena. Uh -huh. And basically, satellite pictures were showing these formation of brown clouds across South Asia, and especially over India and parts of Pakistan, Bangladesh, <laughs> Sri Lanka. And uh, it was obviously because of pollution. And the government started reacting in a way that was basically not helpful. It made me start thinking, what if this brown cloud was to actually come in a tangible way, that not from a satellite, but you could see it hovering around you, how, what would you do? 
and to me it came from a space that climate change which is very much a reality of our lives today uh, is no longer framed by science the actual science is very much there it's definite we all know we are experiencing it but the way we perceive climate change is what the media tells us what the politicians tell us what our parents tell us what our neighbors tell us what social media tells us and so Bura is basically a look at the way people define this mm. phenomenon. And then I wrote Sabi and the Memory Keeper, which you already know, came mm. from a place of personal loss. And I was dealing with something huge in my life. And uh, I turned towards looking up, and then the pandemic happened. And I started looking outside my window because all I, I was all alone. All I had were the clouds outside. Mm. And I suddenly realized that one of the ways we deal with many things in our life is through nature. So this is about a girl who moves with her family, which has suddenly become smaller because Savi has lost her father. And they move to Shajarpur, which is where her father used to live. So she moves with her mother and her sister. And she's very really angry. She's angry she's lost her father. She's angry she's had to move cities. And she's angry that she's gone to a school where there are really cool and hip people who are very mean to, to, to everyone. And then suddenly she comes across this tree, which turns out to be magic. And she starts dealing with her grief while looking at the kind of grief the city is going through with climate change. So, yeah, I think a lot of my work is just taking science and putting it into stories. Oh, interesting, yeah. Interesting. So that means uh, in that book, Savi, at some point, as you said, uh, she's undergoing to some emotional trauma, right? So she starts communicating with the trees, right? Okay. And... Uh, it's actually based on, there's the school researcher, uh -huh. her Susan Simard, and she was walking in a forest and suddenly she looked at these roots of trees and she realized that they are covered with these Bangai. Uh -huh. And from there, she, there's been pivotal research that basically say that through this mycorrhizal network, which is what it's called, <laughs> trees communicate with is each it? other. So they share nutrients. Uh, have you all looked at the rain trees of Bangalore ever? The ones that have those little blue pink flowers? Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yes, yes, pink flowers, yes. Not the very bright pink uh -huh. ones, but they're like little uh -huh. specks. Mm. Go and stand under a rain tree and look up. You'll see <coughs> the branches have this, they look like atlas maps. You know, the branches just reach out among the sky. Not a single branch touches each other. Unlike us in a Bangalore bus where you are fighting and elbowing with others, the branches let each other grow. That's called canopy shyness and that's what trees tell each other. Hey, I'm growing, give me some space. Good. Yeah, so... That research blew my mind and I was like, we knew trees talk, we knew plants talk. But the fact that they communicate so effectively, a dying tree will give all its nutrients to its neighbors and then die. That's how unselfish, they're also very selfish by the way, but they're also very unselfish. And from there, that idea of something communicating with trees came in. What a connection, yeah. Seriously, I didn't notice this. Now I start noticing. I'll go especially near that pink tree. Yes, uh, right now they're not flowering, so right now they're just green. So just go stand under a rain tree, that's where you see it the most. Is it? Okay. Interesting. <laughs> okay, so uh, your educational background, while you write your books, that also helps you a lot. right? And also your uh, real life time situations also. So how do you try to connect, how do you mesh them all together into one book? That's why I have so much white hair. Because <laughs> so much. I think um, a lot of it is like, for instance, in Bura, there's a moment when um, all the farmers come to Vidan so, uh, Sabha uh -huh. in Mumbai oh. and are coming there and saying that this climate change is impacting our harvest. Mm -hmm. And we've had farmer protests that we've seen in India, you know. And so a lot of it does come from reality. A lot of it comes from the work I've done. I've worked with farmers <coughs> when I worked with Fedrain. I, I met farmers in Odessa, in uh, Telangana, in Maharashtra. And, you know, sitting here, we don't realize just what the impact of uh, delayed rainfall. It, we just see it in prices and scarcity of a certain fruit or vegetable or mangoes. But what it does to you when you're a farmer, when 
you know, the rain doesn't come or there's too much rain. Mm. And those are the little things that, uh, not, I mean, these are the huge things that I try to kind of distill into my stories as to, because I think it's all about people, places, and animals, and how does all of, how does life affect them, and mm. how do our actions as human beings mm. impact them? Mm. I mean, a farmer somewhere far away is being impacted because groundwater is being depleted by city people. Mm. Yes. And you know who really cares about that when you tell them it's children. Mm. You tell the adults, they're like, yeah, too bad. Aaj khade mein kya that kind of a thing. You tell children, they're like, how can that be? What can I do? And I think that's really uh, what I try to put in my books. So, that's interesting, yeah, again. Yeah. And also, I think you need a lot of observational skills also when you are with all these uh, situations. I mean, in throughout your life, that does it really matter? I think it hugely matters, and uh, I always tell this to uh, my readers that writers are thieves, and they all get very upset. They're like, "What?" But I'm like, "One, we are thieves, and one, we are liars." Uh, because you know how when you are young and you you're lying and your parents will be like, you're telling a story. So that's basically what we're doing. We're constantly taking stuff and fabricating it. So one, we are definitely storytellers in that sense. But the second thing is that we always take from real life. We look, um, you know, that's why I never be friends with a writer. You never know what's going to turn up in their stories. Um, I have a story about a girl who's terrified of animals, which is based on my sister who's, I love animals and she can't stand anything that ha doesn't have two legs. Like, she's terrified of it and she can't, she's just now immortalized in a book because of that. Mm. So, yeah, there's a lot of observing that happens. Um, it's a lot of pauses that you need to take to just see the world and kind of think what does it mean at a micro level, at a macro level, uh -huh. and weave it together into stories. Yeah, but I would say more than observers, we are thieves. Thieves, okay. And not plagiarists. <laughs> no. Not plagiarists. <laughs> okay, so do you consider yourself as an environmental, cha environmental champion or a climate warrior? I'm a warrior. I used to be a champion. Now I've decided I'm a climate warrior. My bio says that because I'm constantly worrying and I don't do anything. I write books. I used to go out and do a lot of campaigning, a lot of work, hands on. Now I sit at home and I fret and fume and I'm just like, Ye kia no de. look what is happening and then I write about it. So I don't worry. <laughs> okay. Not a good place to be at. Be champion. Okay. okay. So uh, may I request you to read an excerpt from your book at present now? So we just have this book. I absolutely love. They are called the League of Extraordinary Uncles and Two Aunties. T and T U and T A. And uh, basically, they are the movers and shakers of the world. They are the ones who make decisions about the world. They are the <coughs> ones who can change the path of a river by damming it. They are the ones who will get a factory approved in a coal forest area. And so they're powerful people. And today, they are celebrating something huge. And it comes much later in the book. So I'm going to ask you all to join me in this reading because I can't read it by myself. Mm -hmm. um, Uncle number 97 was late. He stepped into a dark room where a shiny disco ball flashed diamond shards of light across the dance floor. He blinked in rapid succession and quickly pulled on his sunglasses. Music pulsed through the room, Bollywood and pop numbers from the 80s. He smiled to see his friends from the League of Extraordinary Uncles and two aunties boogieing away. Everyone was boogieing except Uncle number 34, who sat grumpily in a corner chomping on a pani tikka. Everyone was, and now have you all heard the song Awa Awa? Okay, so uh, when I put my hand up, please say awa awa. So everybody was uh -huh, dancing, dancing. Uh -huh. All hands up in the air. Uh -huh. All legs moving to the right. Uh -huh. Lovely. All uncles doing a nagin dance. Uh -huh. You've seen them do that, right? It's quite funny. 
Dearly you, ETA, was celebrated. <coughs> Uncle number 97 quickly joined them. Uh, now when I raise my hand, you know there's a part in the thing they say, bang, bang, remember? Okay, so when I raise my hand, please say that. So he joined them quickly. Bang. Trees were dying. The dark tree's deathly day was closed. Students, bang. what happened? Loudly. More buildings. Bang, bang. More flyovers. Bang, bang. More concrete. Bang, bang. Statue. <laughs> Uncle number 35 announced, holding his hands up and striking a pose like Elvis. Everyone immediately froze. froze. No, no, he said not the game. I mean, we must win the statue. To commemorate our work, everyone unfroze and cheered. Yes, more statues, more. Everyone raised their hands in the air and resumed dancing. Three knew their days were numbered. The uncles knew the trees, trees days were numbered. It was definitely a gold letter day. Awa, awa. That was such an incredible day. We just enjoyed. Yeah. Can you just clap a little loudly, student? Yeah. So, uh, is it? So, do you also, uh, so is this the career, I mean, you have chosen this career of writing, right? is this a passion and uh, how do you manage, because I also heard you also work something. So, how could you manage doing all the things at one time? So, here's the thing, nobody tells you, is that writing books doesn't make you have an overnight success and you don't become trillionaires like uh, Jeffrey Archer and Chetan Bhagat and John Grisham and all of that. Um, writing books is a lot of work, but um, in India, the advances are less. It takes a lot of time to build an audience, all of that. So I do have a day job. Um, I have to put my FTs and have my, my and buy my fancy cheeses and all of that. So I do have a day job. I work as an editor. I used to first edit a magazine called Time Out in Bangalore which actually gave me the chance to visit nooks and crannies of uh, Bangalore, going to Avenue Road, going to Tipu's Fort, all of that, Cabin Park, or walks for, to look for ads, stuff like that. And now I, my day job is my dream job. I get to make picture books for children. I lead a team where we make these books for very young children. And with a focus that's on literacy, but also one of the things that as you work in media, you realize that a lot of places are not are very homogeneous. And one of the things we try to do is make sure that more diverse writers from the margins of India that represent different parts of India uh, are, get to tell their stories in the way they want to. So mm -hmm. that's my day job. I I get people to tell me stories. Oh, interesting. That's interesting. Seriously. So you manage. That is what it is. Time management, how about the time management and the other aspects? It's very hard, I must admit. And some days I'm just like, I cannot do everything. Uh -huh. So, um, I don't know the ideas, I guess. Um, you sometimes don't have a choice. You have to tell a story. Um, and then you tell it. But also, you know, as you get more senior, you're able to work out your hours. I have a fantastic team, so which means that I can trust them with you know, making decisions, we're doing a lot of uh, the amazing work that we do, so working together as a team. And I think once that's set in place, then your mind's freer to... Mm, yes. and, but it's still the same, uh, same, uh, same <coughs> world, right? Like, it's still books. But mm. let me tell you, the editing brain and the writing brain is very different. So my copy, when I work as an editor, is something like 400 words. And this is something like 80,000 words. So when I'm writing, I'm just like, do I need 80,000 words? I just need 400 words for a book. Mm. And then I'm like, no, no, you're writing a middle grade fiction. Write more words. So it is hard. It is very hard. Yeah, very difficult, yeah. So thank you so much, Bajal, as well. You know, we would like to take some questions from our students, uh, you know, so that, you know, they won't get bored as of now. Yes, students, can you just start with the questionnaire Q&A session for a few minutes? Any questions here? No questions? I'll start asking the questions. Yeah, better. Yeah. 
students, no questions. What do you all, well, you all are mass media students, right? Media students? What do you all want to do? <coughs> Where in media do you want to go? You have to tell you I think uh, somebody is. <laughs> <laughs> You're amazing student coordinator. Yes. <laughs> Any questions? So yeah, you all were saying what? What do you want to do in mass media? In media. So PR, writing, video, social media. What is it that you guys want to do? Nothing is also a great option. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. Students, seriously. Not decided. I'm going to start asking. What do you want? Yeah, now I think that yes. is better. I, I wanted to go on a... Uh, uh, I wanted to go towards the field of marketing. Marketing what? That's something I want to say. Which is, I think, I think it's getting trickier and trickier because um, all the traditional avenues of marketing have really changed and they've changed so drastically that I think everyone's still figuring out what is marketing and mean in this kind of a dynamic. Which also is interesting and exciting, I think, in many ways. So mostly people, do mostly people want to do marketing? No. Uh, what about you? Yes. Uh, print media. Oh. Well, well, well. I feel like full like camaraderie with you because that's where I come from. And I think uh, it's uh, one of the most exciting places to learn everything. Uh, I learned in print media and uh, even now uh, I have like my books, uh, the books I edit have got to won, win awards and all. And the person who I still credit for all of that is the editor who trained me because you know, I think print just gives you that grounding in media and says like gives you the set, it gives you the set of rules, the basic ethics, all of that. And so now my team is stuck with me having all those very rigid rules and ethics, and I'm like, oh, no, that we're not doing that. Why? Because my editor said we could not. But yeah, I'm so glad to hear that. Any of you want to work in environment? <coughs> no? So, uh, I want to ask you one question. One question just came into my mind. Like, how much time uh, will, I mean, if you do you take generally to write one book? And how much time does it need to get it published? I mean, from start, it's a great start to end. How much time do you guys think book making? Yours. 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 Yes. <laughs> um, Buddha took me six years to write. Six years? Yeah. I couldn't come up with an ending. I kept trying to think, uh, how do you solve climate change? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I said, maybe I need to put some magic in it. There's no magic in that book. Um, and so then um, it ended with something that I took from reality, but it took me six years. And then I wrote a first draft, it got accepted by a publisher. Uh, I have an agent who uh, sends it to publishers. And then I told my publisher, you have a completely different draft because I rewrote it completely from the um, perspective of another character. Because I kind of felt like I was telling a story that was too privileged a story. And I wanted a character in there who tells it how it is, as to how climate impacts the people who we, um, like one of my characters is Tammy, and she's the one who's constantly seeing the impacts of climate change. Uh, her grandparents get stuck in a deluge. Um, she's the one who loses her house in many ways. And, you know, she's the one who needs, who finds her voice in the book. And so I think without that, the book would not have been what it is. So I went back and rewrote it completely. So there are lots of drafts. And I think the editing process and the publishing process takes about a year um, because uh, there's editing, then there's um, a lot of my books have illustrations because I think we live in a very visual world today and we need to have ways of communicating that bring together text and images. Also, I, I get to work with some amazing illustrators, mm -hmm. and so um, I take advantage of that. 
And uh, so then a lot of that goes into art direction, uh, getting the right illustrator, fitting them to the book. Um, the, uh, and then fact checking, I sent my books to a lot of uh, experts to read because they're about serious subjects, even though they're supposedly very funny, my readers say. Then there's typesetting, which is when they lay out the book. And then there's proofing. And then there are final dummies made, then it goes to the printers where uh, we get to decide which papers we are using and all of that. And then it goes to the distributors and then it goes to bookstores and uh, <laughs> e-commerce websites and then readers get it. Readers get it. Long process. But yes, good. I just wanted to understand the actual process that's in this. Just very long, very long process. Yeah, you need a process. <laughs> but I also think that's good because slow. We, we live in a very fast time, and slow is good. Mm -hmm. There's a yeah. I want to ask a question. It's okay. Uh, I don't know. No, I want to ask that, um, especially like college students and young working professionals. I've seen, like, I've observed that a lot of them are budding writers and you know they're interested in writing, they have a flair for writing but uh, they don't sort of uh, get the time and mental space to be consistent with writing uh, given their day jobs and how involved they are in that. So how do you suggest that they sort of navigate through their work and while also establishing themselves professionally and academically and still pursuing their interest in writing? That's such a great question actually. Uh, I think the thing is that a lot of people feel that you should be writing every day and uh, a lot of my writer friends do show up at their desk every day and writing is a muscle. Uh, it's like when you go to the gym and you train and you become much more toned. So writing is the same, you keep at it. Um, but I also think that uh, sometimes we get very hard on ourselves because we live in a very cluttered world today. Uh, when I uh, when I was your age. We had very little to do. <laughs> like a Shahrukh Khan film coming out was the biggest event of my life. Uh, so you know, there was no Netflix. We, uh, you know, we had ZTV and all of those. So the distractions were lesser. So it was easier to spend time with passions. But I think if you're passionate about something, you're going to have to carve out that time. Um, I have friends with day job who wake up at five in the morning to write so that they can get their books out there into the world. But also I think write for yourself. Uh, you have so many gadgets with you. I always keep a pen and paper, yeah. I'm notoriously teased for having constant pens in my bag in different colors. But you know the notes app on my phone is just full of little snippets. I'll be sitting somewhere and um, suddenly see something. Um, I have a friend whose book has just come out. It's called Intertidal. And, uh, and his book is just like little like po little stories of the world he sees when he's walking around the shore. Mm. It's a lot it's a lot more as well. And I think just starting to write what you see and not lose touch with your thoughts and feelings. I think once you start doing that, you'll start missing it, so it'll become a practice. So find the time. Uh, see one <laughs> less episode of uh, whatever the show is out there right now, which I'm totally guilty of binge watching, but uh, yeah, you'll find a time if you care about it. Uh, hi, good morning, ma'am. Uh, so ma'am, since you've been writing enormously uh, for children and for kids, uh, since that is your strong suit, so ma'am, I wanted to understand that how much of psychology goes behind understanding uh, kids? Like how much of research uh, do you go through and how do you navigate that? Like how do you go about the psychology aspect of it, ma'am? So you know, here's the one thing that when you're a children's author and uh, uh, you become very lucky because of that. See, when I'm writing a story about an alien, it's very hard because I've got to start thinking of sci-fi and like what is it like to have three eyes and, you know, be purple in color and all of that. When you're writing for children, what you basically need to do is go back to your childhood self. Because, yes, children today have a very different sense of growing up because, again, media clutter, um, there's so much more tech savvy. My nephew's way more tech savvy than my parents, for instance. I'm equally tech savvy. I'm pretty good at that. But, you know, they grew up in a world which is with, is a post-digital age in many ways. And so I recognize that, but what we 
what stays the same is the feeling of childhood. Okay. You know, so the fact like for instance, um, when you first walk into a new school, that sense of fear. Am I going to get accepted or not? Am I going to get bullied? Or, you know, uh, that sense of, uh, you know, there's a scene in Savi where she goes out with this new cool friend she's uh, got. And they go to this fancy restaurant and everyone starts ordering these fancy lattes and meals and all of that. And then they divide up the check. And she has a tiny espresso, but she doesn't have the same kind of money that they have. And then they divide the bill and she's to pay some 500 and some rupees or something. And she's just like, oh, no, I can't buy that thing anymore. So that sense of, you know, I need to stay with cool, but I may not have the same kind of resources. So it's that feeling that I try to inhabit. So getting into the shoes of childhood, I think, is what I try to do. But yeah, because my day job is working with children, now, there's a lot of that. I do read up a lot about child uh, psychology in terms of how they read, how the, our reading brain works, which is very really fascinating. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank So no questions, students? Shall we go ahead? Yeah. They are all hungry actually, yeah. They are all tired now. So uh, thank you so much, Bijal. Before we end, any, no, about some words of encouragement for a young budding writers who want to take that big bold step and they want to pursue their careers, at least me. You know, um, you all are going to go out into the world and do different things. Some of you will go into journalism, some of you will go into marketing, some of you will be doing social media, some of you might do a U-turn and go into something completely different. Some of you might become bakers, I don't know what. But you know, I feel like one of the things that I can say that whatever you choose to do, immerse yourself into it completely. Do your research. So if you're going to become an author or a journalist or a writer, research your beat. Uh, read books about it, watch films about it. Uh, talk to people about it and listen. I find that uh, that's the only way you can go ahead in anything that you choose to do. Immerse yourself completely in that to the point that you become very boring to your friends. They're like, yeah, who only talks about books or she only talks about climate change. But I think that's part of evolving as exactly. to do better. So if you want to become a writer, keep reading. If you want to become a marketing person, keep buying. I don't know. That was a joke. Uh, but I'm just saying that get into your history. Who were the great marketing people? Who was who were the fantastic journalists who worked at the Times of India? Which mm -hmm. Times of India has been pioneering in terms of journalism. Mm -hmm. So do your research and you'll find that that will really help. So, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Vijay. writers and potential writers should follow to stand out in the community? Okay. Uh, I think uh, a lot of new writers actually come up to me and ask me that and uh, I, I have realized that there's one thing that uh, you know even now if you ask me about this one book I read as a child it's called Little Woman. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you all have seen the film adapts and the Korean uh, K-drama adapts all of that. Uh, it stays with me constantly. And what I've realized is that when you write something, when you create something that you've done with a lot of honesty and integrity, don't get caught up in the, I need to get, I need to do 15 reels on Instagram. Do reels. Good for you if you've got, if you know how to. Um, I need to do this many talks, all of that. Do all of that. But here's the thing. I think when something's done with honesty and is good, it will survive. Um, my book of Cloud called Pihura came out in 2019. And even now, I'm constantly getting letters from children about 
what about that reading the book. A lot of academics are write, writing papers around uh, uh, green books and Hura and Savi feature predominantly in that. So I think the one thing is to let, to realize that a book is not a product, it's something that outlives all of us. Mm -hmm. And I think Little Woman is perhaps a great example of like how I read it as a child. You all may not have, some of you will have read it, but some of you have watched it. So just have faith in yourself. Uh, but at the same, and at the same time, I would say don't look at what others are doing. And I think uh, I don't know if you all watch the new film "Koge Ham Ka" by Zoya Akhtar, right? Uh, I mean, I think it's produced by her. And I thought it was such a great thing on just uh, how sometimes social media makes you feel very like everyone's doing great, and I'm not. Trust me, no one's doing great. Um, and I think as a writer, just concentrate on your craft and that's where you get your readers. Social media will get you lots of eyeballs, but your readers will be with your books. So just trust in yourself. Um, yeah, so talking about the types of book items. So I personally like like interactive items where a uh, author speaks in the book and they're like when the reader reads it, they feel like they're interacting with the author. So that's my kind of book. And so while writing the book and we're having the character development going on, and we have to make sure it's in track and we're not getting out of track, but at the same time, like you're keeping them engaged and interesting. How do you do that? You know, characters are some of the weirdest things you do write. Uh, you know, they take their own lives and uh, sometimes you just have to trust that. But when you're creating characters, when you're right, creating your plot lines, you need to know it intimately. And I don't think you have to know it at the beginning. But you know, as you're writing your character, I need to know if Savi likes pineapples on her pizza. Is it going to come into the book? Maybe not. But I think I need to know that because it would perhaps determine the kind of choices she will make when she goes to a restaurant. Or uh, I need to know and this is very typical to a story writing, is what are her needs as opposed to her wants. So she wants uh, her father back, which is not possible. What does she need? She needs stability. She needs love. She needs to know that she can remember her father even as she grows up. So I actually have like this whole exercise where I do, I draw the character first. I do a list of things they like and dislike. I see their needs and wants, so I make a whole chart of that. So my whole wall, uh, much to my late partner's horror, used to be full of post-its uh, saying, she doesn't like this, this one does that, the villains are like that. And then, you, then even then, they continue to surprise you because they are people. And so you've got to let them go. So my thing is that research as much as you can about them and then if they want to be like, you know, they're mostly teenagers and tweens and you know how you all were when you were teens and tweens. You did your own thing. You've got to let them do that also. So much visual man. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Bijan ma'am, for this lovely session and inspiring all of us here today. So, and also thank you, Christ, uh, Christ to University, Asta, and your whole team. Sorry, my mistake and your whole team to organize this uh, event at a very short time. Thanks a lot for all your support and uh, everyone over right here. One, one thing, just do one thing. Even if you're not reading a book today, just go and stand under a rain tree. Go look at that be shyness. Just for yourself, go see how trees communicate. I promise you, it's a little life changing. But thank you so much, great questions, and lovely talking to all of you. And I can't wait to see your bye bye. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Before we wrap up this wonderful um, gathering, I would want to express my sincere gratitude for this inspiring book reading session. Uh, it was a privilege to hear directly from you, Bidil, ma'am.
and gain a glimpse into the passion and dedication that went into crafting such a remarkable piece of literature.